I think the content certainly is very different. Um, it is a very complex field, well, as all of them are, but this, this is particularly complex in the sense that it ties together not only biodiversity but also ecosystem services and how that impacts on human livelihood options uh, around the world. So it is it's a rather complex arena that we're trying to tackle. Um, the fundamental processes of running an assessment are are stem from the IPCC and then the way that they've established their processes. Uh, we have to modify that slightly to try and to try and address the complexity of the the area we're working with, and in particular, it means that we have to look at multi-scale assessments, which uh, complicates things slightly. Uh, we also have to make sure that we have a a pretty broad disciplinary or transdisciplinary representation on all our activities to make sure that we don't neglect areas of work that could improve our understanding as far as the changes that are happening in, happening in the physical world but also in the biodiversity but also then as far as the consequences for human livelihood options are concerned. I, I think our concerns are the same as most other people around the world. Um, I think the pressures that we feel on our biodiversity are precisely the same pressures that other people are exposed to. It's over-exploitation of biodiversity resources. Uh, it's the consequences of invasive species, the consequences of land transformation um, and habitat degradation that goes with that. I think our society is not different from anybody else's around the world. And of course, we are a biodiversity-rich country. We're one of the mega biodiversity countries in the world and therefore we don't only have a national obligation, but we also have an international obligation to look after what we have. And so uh, we have to try and make sure that we uh, conserve our biodiversity for our own reasons, but also to, uh, as part of the global effort. Well, we, we support fundamental research. And one of the areas in which we support a lot of fundamental research is in the area of uh, biodiversity conservation. Uh, we have researchers at universities across the country and uh, their projects are funded on a competitive basis in the area of biodiversity. But we also, one of the things that we do besides funding is we run large science infrastructure in the country. And one of the infrastructures, the platforms that we've established is called the South African Environmental Observation Network, which is a a network of sites around the country that monitors long-term biodiversity and environmental trends uh, across the country as part of our contribution to the global effort to, to make sure that we get a handle on what's happening in the long term. And we make this platform available to researchers from around the country to, to, to send their students there and to make sure that we have a collective view across the whole country of, of what's happening as far as biodiversity is concerned. These processes take a long time and uh, they, sometimes they, they appear frustrating but I think we're getting to the point now where we're starting to converge on, on, on the output that, that most people seem to, are starting to feel a degree of comfort with. So I hope that the final considerations that we will be forwarding to the IP Best Plenary uh, in Nairobi will contain the kind of assistance and the kind of inputs that they would require to help them make the best possible decisions and to make sure that IPBS gets off on the best possible footing so that uh, uh, we can move ahead pretty soon in, in launching this very new kid on the block as far as assessment activities are concerned. I, I think the focus of this workshop was particularly to generate the, 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 the document that's going to be presented to the IP, IPBS plenary. But, you know, conducting assessments is a social process. And uh, in the process, of conducting that work, you very often develop and establish networks. And I think what you've seen here today is also the birth of a, of a network of scientists that are going to be working together and collaborating into the future to make sure, and hopefully we can expand that considerably uh, as, as the, the work progresses. But um, this just forms the kernel, I think, of, of the people that are likely to take this initiative forward at least for the next couple of years, but hopefully after that the next generation of scientists can take the lead and, uh, and show us the way forward.
It, it is very important. I think as, as scientists and, and part of the science community, we have to understand what our role and our responsibility in society is. And at the same time, there are people that are elected into political positions of office uh, where they have particular roles and responsibilities. It will always remain the role and responsibility of political office bearers to make policy. Uh, we can't do that. We're not mandated to do that. And frankly, we're not trained and we don't have the background to do that uh, in most cases. But what we can do from a scientific point of view is to present to policymakers uh, consequences of decisions that can be made into the future in terms of what is going to happen if you make a decision A or you make a decision B or a decision C. And then it, we have to leave it up to them to make the right decision. Uh, and so what we do is, is give them policy options, if you like, or not necessarily policy options, but at least gives them decision-making options that they can consider. And uh, then it's up to them to make the best call. We're not necessarily putting, you know, uh, what we have to do is we have to ask ourselves how can we assist them to make sure that, that they can possibly make the best possible decision. And uh, whatever we can do to assist that process, that's our job and our function. And I think the same goes for every other sector of society. Well, I, th I think they add value in two senses um, to what we're trying to achieve. We understand that sometimes uh, developing countries don't have the capacity to conduct assessments of their own. Uh, they also don't have the capacity to uh, necessarily manage the environments in the way that they would choose to if they had uh, the resources available. And so what we have to do is to do, th do two things. We have to work with people from those countries to make sure that we come up with a perspective and this of what is happening around the globe and hopefully this can give them a window about into what's happening in their particular area that they may be concerned about as well. As that's the one thing, so multi, these multilateral agreements make it possible for countries, even if they don't have their own capacity, to at least get a window on what's happening in their own biodiversity domains. Um, but then, of course, they have to do something about it. And that's the second thing that these, these um, activities do, is that they bring together people that work together. And you would have seen that one of the major objectives of IPBES was to make sure that we develop capacity as far as conducting assessments is concerned around the world. And we will be focusing on those countries and those areas where that capacity is most needed to make sure that we bring in the young people, that next generation of scientists that can take this initiative forward uh, so that we have a better representation and uh, a more equitable distribution from around the world in, in future activities of this nature. What assessments usually do is they use, a multiple, use multiple sources for funding and, and we get assisted, uh, as an assessment process you get assisted by the, the governments, of course, this is an IP best process. In other words, the people that commit themselves to support this activity into the future. So what you will find is that uh, governments from around the world that feel that they can contribute to that process will contribute in a way that they feel comfortable with. So you build up a little bit of a pot like that. And then you work together with bodies like the UN agencies and the NGOs around the world that are all involved in biodiversity conservation. And everybody tends to pitch in and, and, and throw a little bit of money into, into the pot. Um, the job of the assessment is to make sure that we distribute it properly so we can get the work done across the board and we don't actually leave major gaps as far as it's concerned. So what tends to happen is that through the collection, collective resources that are put together in this process, uh, they tend, do tend to make sure that the money is spent in a way in, in, in areas where there may not be any uh, resources to, to, to participate. There's always going to be a trade-off between development objectives and, uh, and biodiversity conservation. But I think we have to ask ourselves not only what is the trade-off, but also what kinds of developments are going to be more aligned and, less, and more benign, if you like, in terms of the biodiversity consequences. So important issues like the development of a green economy, uh, looking at the way we, we manage our water resources and everything else. It's, so it's not just a question of development versus conservation, it's a question of what kind of development is appropriate and will allow you to pursue your conservation objectives simultaneously if you possibly can. So I think that is the, the kind of mind shift that we have to try and engineer in, our, in, in all our societies. Um, not easy, but uh, that's, that's, the, that's the ask.